Y'all planning for this? Hello, TPR Nation. This is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. And today we are going to be talking all about how your team delivers value, but most importantly, how we are going to define value for a client. Because I had a really awakening experience with my team that left me with my mouth dropped open and I shaking my head as I reviewed a lot of the flurry of activity that my team at Shalansky and Associates took in 2022. And I want to share that with you because if it happened with us, it's going to happen in your practice too. As much as you scale up, as much as you train your team to take on more and more responsibilities, you might find that you were in the exact same situation I found myself in in late December. You know at the Perfect RA that we have three tenants that we are constantly keeping in mind and driving us forward in everything that we do. Number one, we want to deliver massive value to our clients. Massive value. And we're going to talk a lot about that in this podcast, what it means and especially what it doesn't mean. And then second of all, we want to spend more time with our family. As I record this, I'm sitting on a beach in Maui, Hawaii, where we have made the January migration as a family that we can come recharge, rejuvenate, relax, and spend time with our family. Now, does that mean during that 30 days that I'm never going to work? Clearly no, right? I'm up doing this podcast recording right now. But that's because my circadian clock has me engaged to get up every morning at 5 a.m. And I'm so passionate and driven in the mornings, I don't want to squander that time. But I'm going to wrap up and conclude my day about the time that my family starts getting out of bed and starts leisurely having breakfast and making plans. What I will not do is spend the entire day on my computer or iPad next to a beach or a pool working. I give myself a dedicated time and then I go play with my family. All right, the third tenant that we're really, really passionate about also is that we have to be profitable. Every action we take, we have a responsibility to ourselves, to our loved ones, and to our clients to be stewards of the practices that we built. We must be profitable in every action that we take. So at our registered investment advisory firm, Shalansky and Associates, I work with our team a lot about delivering massive value and how we can go above and beyond what any other financial advisor is going to offer their clients. Too often in the financial space, the only conversation we are having with clients is regarding investments. And then second of all, we might talk to them about taxes, but only generally if we're a CPA and CFP. Otherwise, we throw up our hands and say, talk to your CPA about that subject. But there are other areas of a person's finance that we could be looking at all year round. And we at Shalansky and Associates, we're not casual about that. We are really dedicated and comprehensive, even though that's a flippant word that gets used far too often. We are really, really thorough about looking at every aspect of a client's finances so that we are delivering massive value on a quarterly basis. You know that we deliver value adds every single quarter to our client. And right now, we're gearing up to offer the 1099 report. Now, at Shalansky and Associates, we partnered with retirement retirement tax services. So that took a tremendous amount of work off of our team and preparing that 1099 report to go out to all of the clients. But it is a low IQ, high value report that you can send out to your clients. I can't believe how many times clients came to me and said, hey, I really liked that value report that you gave me on 1099s. It listed out all my 1099s. It told me which ones I needed to provide to my CPA. That was super helpful because I oftentimes get so confused. When I started to get the flood of responses from clients telling me how much they love that 1099 report, I just shook my head and said, why didn't we do this years ago? Because we're doing that legwork anyway. We are oftentimes getting those brokerage statements from the custodian and we're pulling the 1099s together, the 1099 R's, and we're telling clients or providing clients with those reports anyway. Why wouldn't we just put it on a simple letterhead sheet of paper and a checklist? Now, if you're a backstage pass member, log into your portal and make sure you grab our 1099 report. As a backstage pass member, you get access to see anything that we generate at Jarvis Financial Services or at Shalansky and Associates. If you're an Invictus member, then talk to us about how we have the tool set to run that report for you and your clients. 
At The Perfect RA, we offer two types of membership, backstage passes and do it yourself. It's like a gym membership. Here's all the equipment, but you got to figure it out. And then we also offer an Invictus membership. That is the personal trainer. That is you have goals. We're going to show you exactly the steps to take to get there. And we're going to work out parts of your body you didn't even know existed. So just before we roll out our January value add for all of our clients, we take some time the first two weeks and we do a reflection on the year before. And I task a lot of key performance indicators over to my team. I have uh, three people involved. I have the accountant involved that gives me all of the financial data to support the information. And then I also have our operations lead. And what she does, uh, operations is responsible for the movement of money. If money moves, they're involved. That's new account paperwork, that's transfers, that's rollovers, that's whatever involves distributions, money, et cetera. Um, some of my ops team are licensed, so they have privileges that the other ones don't. And some are unlicensed as well. And then I have my relationship manager. A relationship manager is oftentimes not licensed and they are never allowed to provide financial advice. That is only the financial advisor in our practice can provide financial advice but they have the most contact with the client throughout the year. And they are oftentimes reaching out to them to get pay stubs. They're reaching out to get statements. They're having a lot of that people connection as well as scheduling appointments during our surge period. And so I assign everyone the different key performance indicators for the practice that I want to see for the last year. I track it on a spreadsheet year over year so I can see my practice trends. Remember, what gets weighed gets measured. What gets weighed gets measured. If we just look at that gross revenue in the bottom line. And we said, yeah, we have a pretty good year. That was fantastic. In fact, this morning I had to give uh, the president of our company, Floyd Chelansky, a pulse point because at our October meeting, we decided to onboard additional employees. And we began to wonder if we were going to start tipping the scale on our ratio. And we set a budget to actuals every single year of how we want the practice to run. And we give each category an allowance of how much money. So he began to worry as we staffed up and onboarded uh, new people that we were going to be tipping that scale one direction or the other. And so it was really great to say, you know what, that's our theory. That's how we feel when we're going out to hire people that it's going to cost us so much money. So power tip just for you guys. Normally, I always keep my payroll between 20 and 35% when I do a budget actual. The variance between those depends on the type of practice that you're running. That includes owner distributions as guaranteed payments. If you have a partnership, it includes salary and wages. If you have an S corp, it does not include owner or distributions for profitability that we try to make um, every single October based on how much uh, profit the company has. And then I also want to see what are my practice trends? How many new clients do we meet with? How many leads do we generate? How many prospects onboarded? Uh, the difference between a lead and a prospect. Think of it when you go to a shopping mall and you casually walk in the store, you're just browsing and looking around. The sales clerk comes up and says, hey, can I help you find something? You say, nope, I'm just looking. A prospect is somebody that comes into your department store and says, yes, I need a cocktail dress for Friday night. This is what the attire is recommended as. So a lead is somebody that maybe hits your website, they subscribe to a newsletter, they've had some type of interaction, but they're not really warm. It's oftentimes a cold person uh, that's just coming around to understanding who your brand is and who you are. And a prospect, we've had some type of warm engagement with. And so I want to know how many, and then I, of course, compare it to how many new clients we onboarded by financial advisor. So I get my closing ratio. That closing ratio is really important because as people set goals, oh my gosh, like sometimes I'll work with a financial advisor. I'll say, tell me about your next year goal. Goals and they said, great, I'm going to onboard 30 new clients. 30 new clients next year is a hell of a number. That is a weight contending number. Generally, we're really trying 12 to kind of 18 is our number because we're also very discriminatory about who we onboard as clients. But 12 to 18 clients per financial advisor is a good solid number. So if I hear someone say 30, I'm really kind of intrigued about is that a pipe dream or is that an actual number that you're going to achieve? And if you are achieving that, come on, tell me how you're doing it. How, tell me how you're getting your staff to stay on top of onboarding that many people in a calendar year. What are you delivering them to them normally, et cetera. So we take that number, uh, that closing ratio. And then if I have a financial advisor that says, hey, next year, I want to onboard 10 clients, for example. And I know that he has a 10% closing ratio. Guess what? How many prospects do I have to put in front of him? And now I can give that over to my relationship manager and I can say to her, hey, this is how many prospects that this financial advisor has to meet with 
Let's go load up his calendar with prospect slots. And then on the calendar, it says open for prospect or open for client appointments. And we pepper those into every single surge. And then this is when we have a realistic conversation with that financial advisor to make sure that one, they cannot extend the surge. The surge is the surge. The time that you have been given in order to see all of the prospects or clients is non-negotiable. Because if you as the financial advisor, and I'm talking to you in an enterprise office, if you say, hey, I've got big goals, it's no problem. I'm going to extend my surge by a week or two weeks or a month. What you have done is also extend the surge for the rest of your team. And that should be a collaboration conversation. It is not right to go to your team and ask them to stay in perpetual surge. You have to be able to negotiate with them and make sure you're not burning them out. Otherwise, you're going to be replacing them in two to three years just as they began to get trained on what surge means and how to service clients. It's not the experience you probably want to provide. So throughout December and January, we are doing our financial pulse points. We are looking back at the year and realizing where the gains were. We talked a lot about theory versus fact. And the theory is, as I mentioned, Floyd was really concerned that our payroll was going to be 30 to 50% of gross revenue. And then we cut back and look at it, and that's not true at all. But that was his feeling, and we had to support that information with data as we had it. And we get, do get our team involved in a lot of aspects of that data pulse points because they don't know what needs to be measured. We as the entrepreneurs, we as the business owners, we as the financial advisors know what needs to be measured. And then we're very deliberate and attentive about bringing them into that planning so that they can understand what the impact of those numbers are and why we're so careful to measure them. So by now you're probably wondering, Jamie, this is great information, but you're getting on a tangent about pulse points and key performance indicators. I thought this message was going to be all about value adds and when your team is not providing value. And that brings me to what we discovered in December, January. So as we were going together and we were gathering this information and we were looking at how many times we had points of contact with our clients, which is the sole responsibility of our relationship managers, I started to see a really radical increase in numbers. And that is how many times the relationship managers were reaching out and discussing things with clients. Now, on the surface, that seems like a positive thing. It seems like a good intention of the relationship manager because I already told you that they are going to have more points of contact with the client than you are as a financial advisor if you structure your practice correctly. But when is it too much contact? When is it no longer of value? And instead, you're going to have clients avoiding picking up the phone because what you call them about is not important. It's not delivering any value and it becomes a nuisance. So as I saw the numbers increase radically from the years that we were looking at before, as well as the clients expanding, I had to start really scratching the surface a little bit deeper. And so I took just a couple, handful of clients and I started going into Infinity, which is our custom CRM that Mike Eschelansky and I built. And we started looking at how many times the relationship managers were reaching out to clients and what those conversations were about. And what I discovered horrified me. What I discovered was that our relationship managers were reaching out to the clients about absolutely everything. If a client uploaded a document in their box.com account and we received it successfully, we were notifying them. If the client got an IRS letter, we were notifying them. If a client had a third party CPA or attorney reach out to us, we were notifying them. We were notifying them about absolutely everything. And the most shocking experience is in our practice, we run the 8821s. And that's an IRS form in which you can get a copy of any correspondence that a client is sent. Um, we do this and it has been tremendous of value to us because then we uh, oftentimes are notified if before a client does. So if they are on extended trip or out of the country and they get an IRS notice that, of course, I mean, only the IRS can send you a January 1st letter and say that you have to have a response by January 2nd to them. So if they send us one of these notices, we can get back to the client and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, I know that you're safaring in Africa. We've got this letter from the IRS. You owe $2,000 for the last tax year. Great news. We're going to get with your CPA and we're going to assist you in making this payment while you're on your holiday. There's no concern. 
about you being gone during this time or we'll notify the IRS or something of that nature. We would provide some type of value to the client, letting them know that we were looking out for them at that time. But what was happening in reality, because that was my theory, that was the theory on how this was supposed to happen, was that every single time that we got an 8821 letter back from the IRS and somebody owed 20 cents in additional interest for the previous tax year, we were calling the client and saying, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, did you make your 20 cent payment to the IRS? Now, this responded in one of my more cheeky clients who has good nature, but answered the phone. You know, we had the relationship manager say, Mr. and Mrs. Client, we see your letter from the IRS. Did you make this small interest payment for the previous year? And she said, my God, did they take out a bulletin board? Did they notify everyone? Is it just on Main Street that I'm unaware of? Not only did I receive the letter, my husband received the letter because they were joint filers. My CPA called me and now you guys are calling me over 20 cents. She's like, this is like when you get a check for a penny, but it costs more on the postage to send it to you. And so when are we making phone calls that provide the client with genuine value and when are we not? And also, how do we set that up for our team? Because our team was doing what they thought was a value for the client. And here is why they thought it was a value to call the client over everything. Because we did not set the expectations of what value was for the client. We didn't give them any clarity. We just said deliver massive value, which means absolutely nothing if you do not define what value is. So two really great filters that you can use right now and implement in your office is that value is when something is important or something is useful. And then I would recommend that you have a guided discovery with your team. I would sit them down and I would create on a sheet of paper, a giant 3M sticky and put it on the wall that we could all work with. And I would give those filters and say, something is a value when it is important and it is useful. And then I would create a T chart and I would say, what is important and useful? What is not important and useful? And so then I would have my team go through every single client call that they get and put them into categories and say, okay, great. Is this important? Is it useful for the client? And then I would say, all right, is that important? Is that useful for the client? And we would start deciphering what is a value and what is not a value to call the client about. Here's a low IQ, super simple one, client confirmation calls, uh, when they should be made and how frequently you should make them before the date of the appointment. So for example, ask your team member, whoever that relationship manager is in your office, how do you confirm the appointments? And then let them articulate all of the steps without you telling them how they should do it, Listen to how they actually are doing it. Um, I did this just recently with our team and said, hey, you know, I see a lot of left messages, a lot of confirmations. Uh, tell me about your process. How many steps are you taking? And I discovered that they would call the client three times before the meeting to make sure that the client um, knew when their date and the appointment was. Now, is that delivering value or is that of a nuisance? Calling me one time and leaving a message confirming my appointment and following that up with an email, that is confirmation. Calling me three times is nagging me about that appointment. That's no longer delivering value. That is being obnoxious. Now, when my team articulated this back to me and said, hey, Jamie, the reason that we do that is like a lot of times, you know, clients could be traveling or, you know, they could miss the phone call. And I want to make sure that everyone shows up at your appointment, especially because we have limited appointment availability. And since we run those surges so tightly, a missed appointment could mean that they're going to wait several months before they're able to talk to us again, or we have to put them in a mini surge. So our team is really disciplined. Our relationship managers are so hypercritical about making sure that the clients make their appointments when their appointments are scheduled for that surge. They spend a lot of time, effort, and energy making sure surges runs as smooth as possible. And so they didn't think of it to be a nuisance or harassment or nagging, calling the client three times. Instead, they said, no, I want to make sure this surge is a banner success to every And that means you have to be at your appointment, Mr. and Mrs. Client. So they had every single intention of delivering massive value to that client by calling them three times in addition to that email. And so we sat down and we had a discovery. We said, okay, listen, I know you guys, but if you put left message on the client appointment, we don't know if it's confirmed, but we're going to assume that everyone checks their messages and their email and that the client is going to be there. And oftentimes we rarely have a no show for our appointment. In fact, if we have a no show for appointment, we're oftentimes calling during that appointment to make sure everyone's okay. Maybe there wasn't a car accident at 
et cetera. Um, we go through an entire surge and we might have one out of 500 households that no showed for an appointment. Now, could that be because our team called them three times? Maybe. And as I change this process, we'll figure it out next surge. But instead, I want my team to call and confirm that appointment three days before the appointment. And I want them to always leave a voicemail, always leave a message about that appointment, date, time, and location, and allow and afford the client the opportunity to call you back and can either confirm or assume that they're going to show up for their appointment. Now, if they leave a message, I want them to follow it up with an email. And I want that email to be written out in a certain format so that when the smartphone detects that it's an appointment, it auto populates and suggests that they have that. And that means that we're spelling everything out. If I have an appointment on January 1st, 2023, it's going to read January 1st, 2023 at 9 a.m. And then that way the client can very easily from their smart device, touch on it and add it to their own personal calendar should they choose to. And making sure we have that right format, don't take that for assumption. Make sure you talk to your team and show every single part of their process so that you don't make the same mistake we did and just assume everyone knew what was supposed to happen and how to deliver value on a regular basis. In your practice, you need to sit down with your team and you need to define what does it mean to deliver massive value? What is important for clients to know about and what is useful for them to know about? You know, we talk a lot about the dishwasher rule. In fact, we had several people email into lifestyle at theperfectra.com and they said, listen, this dishwasher rule, I, I think I got it, but I could have a whole episode of you guys talking about what it is, when to use it and when not to use it. So if you're interested in that, make sure you uh, email us at lifestyle at the and maybe we'll do a whole webinar on that particular subject so that you can always take advantage of the dishwasher rule whenever it's appropriate. So as you sit down with your team, you need to make sure as a steward of that organization that you're listening to them and allowing them the opportunity to articulate their processes. And I guarantee you what you think is happening is not what is actually happening. Unless you are handholding, unless you are taking this time to audit, to review, to look back and to make sure that you're talking to your team, you might be really, really surprised about what you find. Don't take it for granted that just because you talk about a concept all of the time and that you're so focused on it all the time, like we are about delivering value and having value adds to assume that your team knows exactly what you're referring to all of the time. They're not in your head. They're not seeing things through your filter. Make sure you're bringing them into this conversation. And then also a willingness to learn about what they think is a value and what they think is not a value. Okay, TPR Nation, you know here at The Perfect RIA, we are 100% about giving you actionable advice that you can take right here, right now, and go implement into your own practice. Whether you're a solo practice practitioner or an enterprise office, this applies to you. Everything that we talk about in these podcasts, this pertains to you specifically. And also your team. If your team isn't listening to the perfect RA, why not? You need to encourage them to do so and be open to their feedback. They're an intricate part of how you operate your practice, especially as you implement the surge part of it. And you got to bring them into the fold. You got to have them as part of that conversation of knowing how how the practice is supposed to be running and why that practice is running. And just because you put something in place, at Shalanskin Associates, we run hands down the best financial planning practice in the country. I thoroughly believe that in my heart of hearts and my truth of truth, I believe that nobody does what we do because I've never once seen it. But that doesn't mean it's impossible if we're doing it, so can you. Here we are in Anchorage, Alaska, the total Arctic, and we're creating this incredible financial planning practice so you can do it from anywhere. But you have to ditch your ego. You have to stop looking for all of the reasons this won't work for you because you're so unique. And instead, think about what if it does work? What if you're able to take these concepts and put them into practice right away? What if you spend 2023 getting out of your own way? What if you start listening to these podcasts, attending our nation webinars, signing up for Backstage Pass, becoming an Invictus member, and transforming your life. What if it was possible for you to deliver massive value, spend more time with the people you love, and be more profitable as a business owner while doing the other two?
I think it completely is, but nothing in your life, nothing in your life is going to change unless you break inertia, unless you are the reason for that change. Nerves that are wired together, fire together. So if you repeat the same habit every single day, every every single year, year after year, you cannot be surprised when you get the exact same results. How many of you are part of masterminds that you're sick of going to because you hear the people repeat the same goals every single year? I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to take my wife on a holiday. I want to earn a million dollars of revenue. And it's a repeat. They don't even have to have a new journal. They could just bring the old one, set it down on the table because they're not doing anything to actually change the trajectory of their life. You can do this. You can change your life by implementing this advice and wondering to yourself, what if this works? What if I listened to this podcast? What if I attended a webinar? What if I became a member of the Perfect RA? What if I sat down with our lead growth manager and as she really transforms my practice and we four exit over the next year to two years? So here's how you're about to be the change that you want to see next year. First of all, what gets measured gets weighed. We talked about this. Make sure you're tracking your key performance indicators. Numbers do not lie. Do not be the type of a financial advisor that thinks one thing, but the facts are completely different. Remove your ego. Start looking at your key performance indicators. Start tracking them on a regular basis. Bring your team in, especially if you have an enterprise model or you're developing an enterprise model. Make sure your operations has key performance indicators that they should be tracking. Make sure your relationship managers have key performance indicators they should be tracking. If you have protege financial advisors, make sure that they know what they should be tracking. What is a good closing ratio? What isn't? How many clients can they realistically onboard? Don't allow them to set up a pipe dream. I can't stand it when people say, aim for the moon. At least you'll fall, what, into the floating mass of gravity and bounce amongst the stars? Have actual goals that you can go and achieve. And if they're big and they're hairy and they're audacious, fantastic. But make them realistic and make sure that you're monitoring and tracking them every single quarter. Action item number two that you need to take immediately for you and your practice, you need to define what is delivering massive value. You need to make sure this has a clear filter and definition for your team and make sure that you're including ways that are examples of delivering massive value and examples that are of providing of no value. Calling a client while on their own holiday that they have a massive tax bill due and telling them, great, Mr. and Mrs. Client, there's no problem. We've already got cash available. Here's how to pay it. That's massive value. Calling a client and saying they have 20 cents in interest due and their CPA already called them and you're the third person, that's of no value to anyone. The third action item that you need to take is you need to sit down with your team member. If you're a solo practitioner and you just got one person, go through it. Start with something really simple. What is your appointment scheduling process? What is your appointment confirmation process? Do you call the client two weeks after the appointment has concluded and make sure that they don't have any outstanding questions. Make sure that you didn't promise them something in the appointment that you haven't yet delivered on or set good guidelines. And then be quiet. Allow them to talk. Allow them to explain what they're doing before you jump in and correct how you want it done. I gave you the example of using the 3M sheet. Um, I use these a lot. I have them at my house. I'm in my office. Um, And when I go to uh, different Airbnbs for business development workshop, we order them and have them sent there so that everyone can get up board. Everyone can jump up out of their seats and we have open collaboration collaborations. Build that T-chart out. Filter through basic steps so that you're giving them the foundations and the fundamentals to know what delivering massive value actually means and how they can be responsible for doing so. Okay, TPR Nation, this is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. Find people who share your values. Go change the world. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. The information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. The perfect RIA, the perfect.